trust that you're having a good week. Uh, just a couple of preliminaries, as always. Uh, if you are signing in, uh, please uh, use the comment section. Say hello. Uh, saying hello in the comment section is always a good way uh, to let others know that uh, people are watching with them. Uh, if you're too shy to do that, I always invite you to like it and uh, use the reactions for that. Um, if you really like it, you can always love it. That's fine. Share this if you would. If you're watching on Facebook, uh, try and get as much of an audience built up as we can. If you happen to be watching this after it was live, uh, you might be watching it on Facebook. We'll go ahead and use the comment section and say hi anyways. If you have questions, use the comment section. And uh, the other thing is you happen to be watching this when it's reposted on YouTube. Why, please uh, like and subscribe to the YouTube channel so that we can uh, get the uh, visibility of the channel up a little bit so that other people that may need this information are going to benefit. Um, in the meantime, I just wanted to say hi to Joe since he signed on. And uh, we're going to go ahead and have a word of prayer and get started, okay? Father in heaven, thank you so much. Lord, you've given us everything. It's in you, Lord, that we live and move and have our being. The least, the least uh, moment where you didn't care about your creation enough to be conscious of us and we would all disappear. Everything would be wiped out, Lord. For we are not self-created and we are not created by evolution. But the very one, the only one who has been within himself has created us out of his own thoughts and out of his own creativity. And we are created beings, Lord, that must, uh, by virtue of the fact that we are created, we must submit to your will. And even the wicked will submit to your will one day, but in a negative sense we thank you god for salvation we thank you god for sending your son jesus for this whole plan that you've had to bring the impossible and uh, make uh, a success out of the salvation of the completely unredeemable thank you god for what you've done you have you have amazed us and continue to amaze us and as we turn our attention to the scriptures again tonight, teach us, Lord. Let this be a miraculous time where we hear from you and hear your word clearly. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Good to see everybody popping on and saying howdy. Uh, there's uh, Sherry. I see. I've, this is kind of like romper room. I see Sherry. I see. Uh, <laughs> There's Tim, there's Daryl, there's Kendall. So good to see everybody tonight. And I'm sure that there's probably a, a one or two up there that just said like. And that's all right. I'm fine with that. We are on the back page of the current study guide. And um, this uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the rich young ruler. Uh, this is recorded in Luke 18, 18 to 25. Matthew 19, 16 to 24, and Mark 10, 17 to 25. Uh, for the sake of the study tonight, we're going to concentrate on Matthew's account, uh, chapter 19 and verses 16 to 24, recalling, of course, that this is a study of all four Gospels at once. So uh, that's why uh, we have all the references and we're comparing everything, making sure that you see and understand uh, that the Gospels, the three, no, the four all together, <laughs> the four Gospels all together are uh, coherent, uh, the cohesive, and uh, they bring out Christ in, uh, in a sense in three dimensions so that he uh, has all of the uh, all of the uh, glory and all of the honor from the scripture verses 16 to 24 chapter 19 here we go and behold one came and said unto him good master what good thing shall i do that i may have eternal life and he said unto him 
Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And he saith unto him, Which? And Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, the young man said unto him, All these things I have kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man hath hardly, uh, shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now this uh, particular passage is uh, one incident, but it covers so much in terms of theology that I think this passage gets preached on quite a bit. So, um, oh, saying hi to Elizabeth, good to see you. And um, we are uh, going to uh, take uh, the scripture we're going to kind of parse it uh, examine the theology in it by then we probably will have answered our questions but we have two questions regarding this passage the first one why would Jesus tell this rich man to sell everything he owns and give his money to the poor and uh, what insight does Jesus statement about who is good give us now as we go down through here like I said we'll probably wind up answering most of these questions uh, but let's go ahead and go through now the very first exchange that we have between this rich young man and Christ is his uh, flowery address uh, he is being uh, he's trying to be uh, genteel here I guess would be the word uh, he's calling him good master what that now you got to understand I'm sure that he meant this don't get me wrong but the way that he's addressing Jesus is a way that he would have addressed Pharisees or he would have addressed uh, you know some some other ruler up above him somebody that that he viewed as being greater than himself it was common in the day uh, you, maybe you've seen some of those uh, old musicals where uh, the, the the people have like Cockney accents in England and they're always calling calling people governor. You know, that's their way of trying to be uh, polite and, and humble themselves before other people. This is the kind of thing that this rich young ruler is doing here. Um, we don't know what this means, rich young ruler. We really don't. We, we, we hear about it. Uh, he's just a rich man. Is he a ruler? Well, it says in another passage he is. So, okay, but that's completely irrelevant to what occurs here. The first thing he calls him is good. Now, Jesus takes this opportunity to make a point. And the point is that there is none good except God alone. Now, that's the point he's trying to make, Jesus is trying to make. Now, we must understand and we've talked about this before, Jesus is both the Son of Man and the Son of God at the same time. The Son of God, that is, that, that manifestation uh, called the Son of God, which is the, in a sense, it's the body, as it were, of the Godhead. Uh, the, as the scripture says, uh, everything that was made was made through him and nothing was made without him. And uh, the, he is, uh, Hebrews 1.3, he's the exact representation and manifestation of God. 
Uh, so here, uh, the Son of God is manifesting himself now at, through the Son of Man, which is Jesus Christ. So we have essentially two men in the same man. Uh, we have one man that is the Son of Man, that is the man Jesus that uh, was born to Mary, grew in her womb, was born, uh, walked this earth. That's the Son of Man. He refers to himself mostly as the Son of Man because the capacity in which he walked among men at this time was to take away sins. And as it says in... Uh, oh, hi, Elwood. It's good to see you. Uh, as... as uh, as the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 2, he had to be made like us, human in every way. Okay, so Jesus, as the Son of Man, is human in every way. Okay, but the Son of God possesses him. Now, we can understand that, and I've said this before, but we may have people that are listening for the first time to, uh, tonight but uh, in, in terms of understanding this, we can perceive of the idea of a demon possessing somebody. That they do this in movies a lot, scary movies, and, and, uh, and they talk about it a lot. People believe that it can happen. You, doesn't, you don't have to talk to too many religious people to find a few, if not all, that would believe that it's possible for a demon to possess somebody. But if you talk to them about the Holy Spirit possessing a Christian, uh, they, oh, no, no, he would never possess us. He, he's with us. He walks by us. He, he talks to us. According to the scripture, there's a possession that takes place. That is that the Holy Spirit is placed in you. That is that he inhabits you as a spirit. Now the word spirit, as we see it in the scripture, is uh, represented in the Greek by the word pneumos, which is the same base word for pneumatic. And you guys know what a pneumatic tool is. If you've ever been in a, in a garage and you're waiting for your car, you might hear brr, brr, brr. That's a pneumatic wrench and it's taking your lug nuts off of your wheel. Okay, so we understand that pneuma means air and in fact the scripture uses the same word for spirit to talk about the word winds jesus said the holy spirit is like a wind you don't know where he comes from you don't know where he's going but you see the effects of it um the scripture says that the minister that the the angels uh are made uh winds uh psalm 104 he makes his angels winds and flames of fire and so we, we see from the scripture that this is an accurate comparison. So if you can imagine then that uh, God, the Bible says, is spirit. Now that means the entire Godhead. That means the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all spirit. And not just one piece of God, not just one part of God. The whole of the person of God is spirit. And Jesus says this himself. Okay, physical man, the son of man, Jesus, says to the woman at the well, John 4, he says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It does not mean that God is spirit except for the son of God who was incarnated as a man. That's not what it means. Okay, he is truly God and truly man at the same time, possessed of the second person of the Trinity, but physically a man walking among us. Now, this is important to understand why he says what he says in verse 17. Okay, if we understand that, then we understand why in his capacity as the son of man, he would say there's, there's no one good except God alone. Because now if he says there's none good except God alone, but he's actually part of that Godhead in in the truest sense, why then you go, wait a minute now, how, how are you talking about God in the second person when you should be talking about him in the first person? Well, if I talk about the Holy Spirit who has taken possession of my life, and I know the day that he entered into me. Now, I'm not saying that I've been a great man and I've been, uh, and I've been, uh, uh, you know, 
puppeteered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't puppeteer you when he comes in to your life and possesses your heart. He doesn't turn in turn into your puppeteer. What he what he does is he dwells within you. He teaches you. He gives you eyes to see and ears to hear. He gives you the ability to understand uh, God, and he sometimes even speaks to your heart. That is, he sometimes nudges you. The old timers used to call it the unction of the Holy Spirit. That is, that sometimes the Holy Spirit moves you to do something or moves you to say something. Uh, sometimes he speaks to you in prayer and it feels like your thoughts. And so you think to yourself, okay, now, did I just think that? Or was that the Holy Spirit? And you usually have to kind of seek that out. Test every spirit to see if they're from God. The Bible uh, ex tells us to do this. Okay, so here we see that Jesus, that is the Son of Man, possessed of the Son of God, says of the one who possesses him that, that he alone is good. Now, Jesus was the Son of God from the beginning of his, of his uh, incarnation. If you recall, Mary went down to stay with Elizabeth, and when Jesus was nothing but what the doctors would call a zygote, she walked up to Elizabeth, who was now six months along, and the baby in her womb leapt at Mary's arrival, and Jesus was hardly what you would call a viable fetus as the son of man. And Elizabeth exclaimed to Mary, how is it that the mother of my Lord should come to see me? And at this point, Mary's not really showing, not really. Now she goes home and she's three months along because of the timing and everything that we see in the scripture. We know that this is the truth. And so when she gets to Elizabeth, why her baby is hardly even developed. And yet the baby in Elizabeth's womb leapt for joy that the embryo about that big zygote or whatever about that big uh, in Mary's belly has come close because the the Spirit of God himself had uh, possessed John in the womb and the second person of the Trinity has possessed the babe in Mary's womb. So Jesus says rightly why do you call me good? Now, I understand that there's some pastors that have a different take on this and uh, their, their attempt at trying to nail down this whole 100% God, 100% man thing uh, is, is a little different than what my take is. And that's fine. That's fine. I'm trying to explain it to you in the best scriptural terms I can. And I'm sure that they're trying to do the same thing. Don't get me wrong, okay? Yet at the same time, the, Jesus is making here a clear separation between the Son of Man and the Son of God. He's making a clear separation between himself as a human being, made human like we are in every way, Hebrews 2, with the Spirit of God that dwells within him, that is the second person, not the third person, the second person of God and he's making a clear distinction and saying the one that dwells within him is uh, good. Now this is the same thing that Paul does in Romans chapter 7 if you have question about this okay it's the same thing Paul does in Romans chapter 7 when he says in I think it's verse 20 he says I know that no good thing dwelleth within me and then he says, that is within my flesh. And you see, Paul here makes a distinction. Because when he says, I know no good thing dwelleth in me, he knows the Holy Spirit dwells within him, the third person of the Trinity, who, uh, who as God is alone good. 
So he says, I know no good thing dwelleth within me. And then he qualifies that to the reader. That is within my flesh. Okay? Paul is very, very specific about that. He, when Paul te- thinks about himself, he re- realizes that he is Paul, the man that was born to his father and mother, the man who's descended from Adam, the man whose body uh, is corrupted by Adam, and one day, while it would be sown in corruption, 1 Corinthians 15, it would be raised immortal um, so er, and incorruptible. So um, Paul is able to make that distinction. And it follows suit that he would not make that distinction if Christ had not made that distinction. And here we see Christ at one point making that distinction. But he has made that distinction in other places besides this particular story. Now, I know that I've said a lot, but the thing is, the thing is, if we don't understand some of this basic uh, theology, why, folks, we're going to get very lost in the scripture because uh, Jesus talks about himself as the son of man way more than he talks about himself as the son of God and uh, this has been used by uh, by people of of a uh, of a corrupt mind to try and say well Jesus never claimed to be the son of God actually he did and the father claimed that he was his son Because the father said on more than one occasion, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So uh, that argument doesn't stand the scriptural test. Um, It's just something that that people say that have a corrupt mind. So moving on now to verse 18. And again, we're just, we're taking the story. We're breaking it down slowly. We're taking a look at the theology behind this. And I hope this is helpful to you. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me go? That's 17, I'm sorry, 18. He saith unto him, Which? Okay, Jesus had said uh, that if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. So now Jesus rattles off the last six. He doesn't rattle off the first four. He rattles off the last six. And uh, these are the these are the ones that have to do with ultimately loving your neighbor as yourself, the last six commands of the of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Uh, and in fact, in verse 19, he specifically speaks that command. Now, he has intentionally left a piece out of the puzzle, hasn't he, Jesus? Because we know in another place they said, which is the greatest commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. We know that he said that in another place. And believe me, the Bible is consistent throughout. And uh, just just the, the very argument of logic says that if Jesus believed that to be true, he can't believe it to be true one place and then not believe it in another place. So the question then is, why is it then that he talks to this fellow and uh, he talks to him about only the last six and not about the first four? And the reason here is that Jesus is saving that those first four the, because those first four are about love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Those first four are about the first and greatest commandment. The last six are about the second commandment. So Jesus gives him the ones that are that are the ones that have to do with how we treat one another, the horizontal uh, commandments, you might say, rather than the vertical ones, which are the first four. Now, as he does this, the young man's reaction in verse 20 is he says, well, all these things I've kept from my youth. So what do I lack? All of what Jesus has been saying has been building up to this question, okay? The other things, did the man keep them perfectly from the time that he was born? No, of course not. Uh, he, kept them, he kept them in a letter probably, but not in spirit probably. Uh, he may have kept them uh, mostly, 
but not completely. Now, uh, I'm sorry, where in the Bible are you reading again? Uh, we're right now in Matthew 19. Right now in Matthew 19. And uh, we're looking at verses 16 through 24. So, um, and that's all right. That's all right. I'm glad you asked because there may be other people that are trying to figure that out too. Uh, where were we? Okay. Um, the rich young man said, all these things I've kept from my youth, what do I lack? And Jesus has been building up to this. So Jesus says to him, if you will be perfect. Now, what does the term here, perfect, actually mean in terms of the uses, usage of the words? Now, if you say perfect, uh, you probably mean without any flaw whatsoever. That's probably what you mean. Um, here, what it means is if you want to do everything required of you, then here. Okay, that's, that's the usage of the term in this particular uh, passage. If you want to be perfect, that means if you want to do everything, if you want to get it all right, then here is, is um, okay, then here is the, uh, the way that you're going to have to do it. And he says you will have to go and sell all you have and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven and come follow me. Now, why would he say this? Because of the first and greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Okay? As long as this man has a safety net, that is, he has his riches, as long as this young man has a safety net, he will always love his wealth more than he loves God. Now, this is a this is a an example for this man. Okay, you can't take this and say all of us need to go sell everything that we have and give all that money to the poor and go wander around. You can't say that. That's not that's not what is supposed to be derived from here in this particular man's case he was so dependent upon his wealth and and loved his wealth so much and his prestige and his stature that he that if he was going to love god with all his heart all his mind all his soul all his strength it was going to require giving up everything that he had and giving the money to the poor. Now, because we live in a day and age where socialism is so popular, I hate having to say this because it, it just is distracting in my mind, but pastors that are out there and it just seems like I'm always harping on things I wish I wasn't because I don't want to have to but if there weren't pastors out there that were teaching that this is God saying that uh, we need to live communally and we need to uh, we need to not uh, not have anybody that's wealthy or rich in our congregation and that if you are wealthy or rich, you need to sell all you have and give it to the poor. And we all need to have everything in common and all that stuff. If it weren't for the fact that pastors are out there actually doing that with this passage, I wouldn't have to say that. Okay? But that's not what it means. He's trying to demonstrate to this rich young ruler the impossibility of following God in his own strength and he's trying to show him how impossible it would be now if he wanted to be perfect that means <clears throat> if he wanted to keep all of the law and all of the prophets it would require him first of all to let go of the thing that he loves more than God in other words in a sense that, that this man's wealth had become like an idol to him. 
And um, because of that, why he, uh, he went away sorrowful because to him, uh, that was the answer. He had found his answer. He had found his security. He had found his, uh, his uh, safety net. And so to get rid of that would mean absolutely trusting God in everything. Now, I've said this before and I'll say it again here. Uh, none of us that are watching this, whether now or whether later, none of us have ever loved the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. There has always been something that you also loved. And you say, well, wait a minute. Well, God can't possibly mean love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength to the point at which you have nothing else that you also love. And actually, he does mean that. Now, you say, well, then what about all of these other folks and people that I'm supposed to care about and I'm supposed to watch out for? That goes back to what we have in Matthew 6, 33, where he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all of these things will be added unto you. What does this mean? This means if you will concentrate on doing the work that God has called you to do, whether it is, uh, you know, reaching out to others through your work or through your clubs that you're a part of or, or just, you know, through casual conversations, sometimes maybe even with strangers in line at the grocery or whatever. But whatever it is God has called you to do, whatever obedience God has called you to, if you'll seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, then God promises to take care of all of the other things that you are concerned about. He promises to take care of your money. He promises to take care of your family. He promises to take care of your uh, needs, uh, your basic needs, as well as your general needs that uh, come up in relationships and work and all of these other things. But if you'll make his kingdom the priority, then he's going to take care of everything. The priority, though. Not a priority. The priority. Okay? So that's what he's calling this rich young ruler to do. To make the kingdom of God the priority in his life. And if he would do that, why then God has promised to take care of all the other things. But this man, he, he can't bring himself to trust God. Because trusting God would mean no safety net. And if God happened to not do what this young man wanted God to do, why then he wouldn't have anything left. Everything would be ruined. And his, his fear, which caused him to cling to his riches was the very thing that caused him to go away from the Lord uh, disappointed and sad and sorrowful. And so here we see a challenge to this rich young ruler that is really a challenge to all of us. And that is, can we come to the point at which we love God, and we have let go of everything else. We no longer fear the loss of our families, the loss of our funds, and the loss of our fellowships. Are you to that point where you no longer fear those things? The only thing that you even fear in the least is, the, is losing a relationship with God which, thank God, you cannot lose so long as you continue in the faith by which you were saved. Now, if you are truly saved, if you've been converted by God, all of the riches of heaven already belong to you. And anybody who dies in Christ, you gain them forever. And there is no loss 
But if you cling to the riches of this world, the Bible has told us that we are going to suffer great loss. And even what we have will be taken away from us. Folks, I don't want to be on that receiving end of judgment. No, thank you. But that's not the thing, though, that drives me into the arms of the Lord. His great love for me and my great trust of him. When you've had your faith put to the test to where you don't even know if you're going to have a roof over your head and yet you manage to keep your faith in the Lord and the Lord sees you through, that's something the that, folks will change your life. It'll change your whole mind. It'll change your whole heart. It'll renovate you from inside out. And we all of us go through a testing of faith. Everything that, that we do is tested with fire. That's the process of sanctification, by the way. And when God tests it by fire, what happens is only the things that were done for Christ remain. And everything that was done out of our own invention, out of our own will, stuff that we had designed and thought of ourselves, that stuff is all burned up. And uh, you and I are tested because God wants us to see how much faith he has built into us. Continue to follow the Lord. Continue to trust him. No, you may not be at the point yet where you can completely trust him in, in the way that the scripture is telling you you need to. But listen, he will bring you to that point. Just keep trusting him, okay? Just keep trusting him. When we get to the end of this, verses 23 and 24, Jesus says unto his disciples, how hardly a rich man can enter into heaven, and it's easier for a rich man to go through uh, the eye of a needle than to enter the kingdom of God. The reason is because when you are happy with your life, then you have no desire to move on. A person who has enough money to do whatever they want to do becomes uh, comes into bondage to their riches. Whether those riches are money, whether those riches are relationships, one of the hardest things for people to break away from is sexual immorality. Now the reason that that is the case is not because of the devious nature, although it is devious, but the reason is because a sexually immoral person so happy in the flesh they may not be happy spiritually but they're very happy in the flesh because they're satisfying their most base desires in the most base fashion with the most base of people and they're so tickled the Bible says that they almost never come back from that You'll notice that the people in our nation who have the most wealth and power are very often the most unhappy people inside. And what do they do? Do they repent? No. They look for more wealth and they look for more power. Rockefeller once, that by legend at least, was asked, you have all of this wealth, you have all of these things, what could you possibly want? And the Rockefeller that was being interviewed said more. Um, folks, this is the rich young man's uh, problem. It is his problem. He is so happy in the things of this world that losing those to gain Christ seems to him 
to be the most devastating proposition that there is. Where are you? That's the next question we need to ask ourselves. Where am I? Can I trust the Lord? And can I let go of the things that that uh, are my safety net? I bring you once again to a passage that Jesus said. He said, whoever wants to save his life is going to lose it. In other words, if you're happy with this life, you're going to wind up losing it. Now, I know that that sounds curiously strange, but Jesus said, but whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. He doesn't mean necessarily whoever dies for the cause of Christ. That's not necessarily what he means, although that could be a part of the list of things that would fit into the category. But what he means is anyone who just lets go, who cuts the tethers that hold them to this earth, anybody that just lets go and grabs a hold of Christ and says, I'm gambling my entire life on you. And I am going to go for everything, for the eternity and for heaven. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to let go of what I have in my hands. Now, this is a good illustration, so I use it a lot. And if you've heard me use it before, you can, you'll either say, oh, yeah, I remember. Or you'll say, oh, not this again. There's a movie that I saw called Brewster's Millions. Maybe some of you have seen it. Now, the version I saw was the remake uh, with John Candy and Richard Pryor. Um, the uh, version you saw may have been the original one back in the 1950s. Um, but uh, in, this, in this particular film, there's a moment that I want to address with you. Uh, if you don't know the story, the story is that this man inherits $350 million <clears throat> from a rich uncle that he didn't know that he had, but the rich uncle doesn't have any other, uh, doesn't have any other, uh, uh, in, in, uh, come on, inheritors, but what's the word? Uh, beneficiaries. Doesn't have any other beneficiaries uh, to give to than this one nephew. And so he gives $350 million to him, but he wants him to be responsible with this newfound wealth. And so he has a proposition, and there's these lawyers. One of the lawyers is the man that played Larry Tate back in the uh, uh, Bewitched series. I, I'm a TV kid, so, you know, bear with me on this. But, but uh, anyways... Uh, they have a satchel, and the satchel has a million dollars in it. Now, the proposition is that this man can take the million dollars and he can just call it, call it quits and walk away with a million dollars scot-free. But if he takes the $350 million, he has to spend $30 million in 30 days and uh, have nothing left to show for it at the end of the 30 days. He can't have any assets at all. Now, this is the proposition of the movie itself. And the movie, you know, goes through the whole, the whole adventure. But there's a moment here where they have that million dollars in a satchel. And Richard Pryor's character, Brewster, he says... A bird in the hand. That's what my mama always said. And then he folds the lid back down onto the satchel, pushes it across the table, and he says, I want to go for it all. Now, this is a good illustration of what Jesus is asking of the rich young ruler and of us. Okay? You have 80 or so years to live in this world. And those 80 years, uh, they're going to be full of joy. They're going to be full of pain. 
They're going to be full of successes and failures, um, but they're your years. And you can either use those years on yourself and forfeit eternity, or you can take those 80 years, push them across the table, and let go of all of these 80 years and say basically to God and maybe to yourself, maybe even in a sense to the angelic witnesses around you, I'm going to go for it all. I'm going for eternity here. I'm not just going to live for these 80 years and give up everything that you might have been, might have had, and could have done with these 80 years in favor of what could happen with an eternity of freedom, uh, real freedom. That's the proposition on the table. That's the proposition for the rich young ruler. But the rich young ruler takes the satchel, keeps the money, and says to him it's not worth giving up what he has in this life. And so he goes away, presumably, to live the rest of his life without God, without Christ, and with only religion and money to show for his life in the end. Folks, that's a, it's a sad, sad picture. It's a frightening picture because you and I are caught in the middle of stuff. And if you're like me, I just wanted to live a peaceful life. I just wanted to enjoy myself. But folks, all of us have to make a decision about what we're going to do. Are we going to pursue God or are we going to just go ahead and live our lives the way we want to live it and take our chances in the end? Well, there is a sure way for us to be saved. And that sure way is for us to be converted. And that is that God converts us. Not that some group of people in a church somewhere talk you into or corner you into making a a choice for God and putting your ex on a box somewhere. No, that God supernaturally comes into your life supernaturally places his Holy Spirit in you so that like the like uh, Christ who was the Son of Man and the Son of God truly you now become uh, a member of the church that is a, an ag- organic member not an organizational one although organizational has its purposes but you become an organic member of the body of Jesus Christ and You also have the same spirit that is in him, that is the spirit of God that dwells within you. Now, Paul calls the Holy Spirit at one point also the spirit of Christ. And so it could be said that when you have been joined to Christ, uh, the two becoming one flesh, then the spirit of Christ himself dwells within you. Um, We're going to pick up with our next passage. Now, as far as the questions, I think we've answered them. Why would Jesus tell the rich man to sell everything and give all he has to the poor? Because he's challenging him to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. What insight does Jesus' statement about who is good gives us? It gives us the insight that God himself is good and that men are not. Okay, now, how complete is our devotion to God and where does that put things? Uh, where does that put the things of this world? Looking at now Matthew 19, still in Matthew 19, now verses 25 to 30. Here we go. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed. Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man 
shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses or brethren, or sisters or father or mother, or wife or children or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive in himself, uh, shall, shall receive, I'm sorry, an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. That, but many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Okay, now I know that at this point I have, what, about 10 minutes left? Okay, so we may not get through everything that needs to be said in this passage, so we very well may uh, pick it up again, okay? But I want us to look at, first of all, what he says here in verses 25 and 26. They ask, who can be saved? Now he says, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Okay, this is an answer to a question about salvation and Jesus's direct answer is with men this is impossible now let's stop there okay because we always we don't like that part but we like the part where with God this is possible and so we you know so that we don't have to suck too much air <gasps> about it being impossible we just move right past that to with god this is possible we say oh shoo, shoo. <coughs> but if you don't appreciate the fact that with men salvation is impossible then you have no appreciation for the fact that with god it is possible okay now you may say well okay then you just stated it and we're good let's move on but I want to explain to you a few things that the scripture tells us. Okay, there, now I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. Okay, but one example is this in Psalm 49. It says that, in verses 7 through 9, it says that it is impossible for a man to give himself as a ransom for another man that he should not die and live forever. Now, this is exactly what Jesus did for you and me. He gave himself as a ransom for us. The scripture is clear about that. Gave himself as a ransom for us that we should have eternal life, that we should not die and live forever. Yet it says in Psalm 49, it's impossible. Do you see what Jesus is talking about here? Just in that one example. I've already shown you what the scripture says, how impossible it is in one simple aspect of salvation for men to save themselves. And one man cannot save another man. And how did Jesus do it? Because of his uniqueness. Now, here is, is a good saying. This is something that you should take to heart. And this is that if you had offended an earthly king, your offense would have died when the king died. But you have offended the eternal one. Which means your offense is an eternal offense which means that if there is to be any kind of sacrifice to take away your sins, it must be made by an eternal man. We don't have such a thing. Every man is born and every man dies. It's appointed unto man wants to die and after that the judgment. But we have this one eternal man, the one who was and is and is to come the Alpha and Omega the one in whom is life that is Jesus Christ we have one person given to us 
This is not about his teachings. Jesus Christ's teachings are faithful, but it's not about his teachings. So if you were able to keep every one of Jesus' teachings, but you were never converted by God, you're not going to go to heaven. You'll be the most religious person in hell, but you're not going to go to heaven. In order for you to be saved, God has to do the savings. Why? Because as Jesus said so simply here in our passage, the disciples, who then can be saved? Well, with men, this is impossible. Now, I'm glad he didn't stop there. But the thing is, you must understand, it is impossible. Now, here's another passage for you. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But as many as received him to those who believed in his name, gave he the power to become children of God. Now, if you have to become a child of God, then you're not one to start with. Verse 13 follows up, children born, <coughs> excuse me, not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, nor of a husband's will. Okay, so not, not born of natural descent. So because you were born into a Christian home doesn't mean you'll necessarily go to heaven. You still must be converted. And then uh, what about the next statement there? Uh, the human decision well that means that you can't just decide you're going to go to heaven you have to be brought to it you have to be you have to be fit for it and then last of all a, a husband's will that means your dad can't just come home and say okay family we're all christians now you know his desire or his will is not enough to save you okay this puts us in a real dilemma here folks because if it's impossible with men and only possible with God, that means only if God saves you will you be saved. Now the good news is that if the Son has set you free, John chapter 8 tells us, then you are free indeed. <clears throat> In other words, your freedom is not tenuous, your freedom is certain. Okay? Now that's a, that's a wonderful thing. It's wonderful that if you have been saved by the Son of God, that is, by God himself, then you've been made free indeed. Now, religion confuses the idea of salvation with adherence to certain principles and tenets and laws. Now, it's nice to keep those. You ought to keep them. The teachings of Christ are important, but they're not the means to salvation. It's the, it's the teacher himself, Jesus He's the means to salvation. And we've talked about this before. How is it that he makes this possible? Well, he says in Genesis chapter 2, he says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is the only law that comes before the fall of man. And when men fall, that law which came before, supersedes the fall. Okay, which is uh, the law of precedent. So uh, in these days, in, well, in, when our juries and our judges and our court system is working the way it's supposed to work, they would look to precedent and they would say, well, in the past, this was the way that it was, and so we will stick with the original. And so if, let's say, that, let's say that the Constitution of our United States, that the Constitution says, you know, blah, 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 okay? And as time has gone on, uh, let's say in 1968, some judge said, uh, well, I know the Constitution said blah, 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 but, I, but, but it really means yakety, yakety, yak. Okay, so then let's say that in this day and age, we've returned to constitutionality, which God help us, I hope we do, but we've returned to constitutionality. Then a judge might be able to say, well, I know in 1968, a judge said that blah, blah, blah really meant yakety, yakety, yak, 
But the thing is, we're going to stick with the original, which was blah, 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 and that's going to apply, and that's going to overturn yakety, yakety, yak. Okay, now, I, I, I know I've been using very technical terms for you, and I apologize. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> but exactly the same thing is happening here. Okay, if we had not sinned, that is, if Adam and Eve had not sinned and brought sin into, into humanity and into humanity's line, making all of us slaves, if they had not done that, why well, there would not have been a need for the law. And if there had not have been a need for the law, why well, then there would not have been a need for the prophets. If there had not been a need for the prophets or the law, there wouldn't have been a need for a savior. Okay, and then you and I would just simply be saved based upon uh, how perfectly we kept the uh, commandments of God. Now, if that was the basis of our salvation, then all of those things would have to be gone from history. No sin, no law, no prophets, and no need for Jesus. But unfortunately, they did sin, which meant God gave them the law later as a way to manage sin, and the prophets came along to point out the impossibility that they had that they had demonstrated in their history, the impossibility for men to keep the law of God. <clears throat> and then there wouldn't have been a need for Christ, but Christ did have to come because it was impossible for men. And so the person of Christ arrives and declares that he is selecting out of humanity a church and that this church will be his bride and he is the bridegroom and that when we have been converted and have been chosen by the Lord that the two are going to become one flesh and we will become one with Christ Christ was perfect in every way without sin did everything correctly he kept the covenant of works that you and I couldn't keep. He did everything that you and I can't do. Not won't do, but can't do. And yes, we won't. But the thing is, even if we tried, we can't. Now that's what the scripture says. Now that being said, <clears throat> why Jesus then becomes the key. If he's perfect, you and I are saved. If he's imperfect, we're no, no, we're no more saved than a Buddhist or than, uh, you know, any of the other, you know, Muslims, world religions and all of that. So we're no more saved than they are if Jesus was imperfect at any point. If Jesus sinned even once, even, even in omission, then you and I are not saved. And there is no salvation for men. And so Jesus triumphantly, after saying that it's impossible with men, he says triumphantly, but it is possible with God. And so it is God who has saved you if you've truly been saved. And then you have no concern other than to press on. Trust him, love him, and let go of everything else that ties you to this world. For this world and its goods are passing away. But heaven is forever. Put your hands on the satchel. Close the lid. Shove it across the table. Just, you know, say, you know, forget these 80 years. I'm going for eternity. And I hope that you will. Well... I appreciate everyone that tuned in and that uh, said hi, and uh, hopefully most of them were able to stay with us. And uh, at this point, we're going to have prayer. And uh, thank you so much for tuning in once again. Let's pray. Merciful God, may your hand be upon us to guide us and direct us. May everyone, Lord, that is within earshot of this, whether tonight or whether later, May they hear the gospel call. May they prick up their ears because they hear their shepherd's voice. 
and may they be converted, saved, and secure for all eternity in the powerful and honorable hands of our Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, folks. Have a great night, and uh, we will see you later on, uh, either on Facebook on Sunday or in person on Sunday for the next opportunity. Bye for now.